Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Dave, alcoholic. So I was down in uh, Tijuana with a nun and a priest and a manager of a movie theater, drinking shots of tequila. I always wanted to lead this with that story. It's a true story. I'll get to it later. But only alcoholics understand that stuff. You know, like if I was at my, my high school reunion, they'd be like, what? You were where with a nun? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get into my story. I just uh, take a pulse. Uh, how many of you have been to workshops before? Okay, so about half. And some of you are new. Um, I'm hoping to bring you a new experience for those that you've had one, um, and I'm trying, hoping to enlighten a spirit in those who have not. Um, I've been, I've grown up in a lot of different areas of AA, uh, and I'll I'll talk about that somewhat in my story. Um, but I truly believe that it, I have no control over what's going to awaken the spirit. I have no control over what's going to be that thing that vibrates the spirit within each person, within each soul. Um, All I can do is try to present, and hopefully it does something for somebody, and then be there if it gets awakened to guide them. I don't believe in um, trying to force. I don't believe in chastising, judging, um, yelling, uh, controlling. Uh, you know, my guys, when I'm working with people, um, I present, we go through the material and we have a shared experience and we talk about it and we kind of go through it together. I hope, and that's what we're going to do this weekend. We're going to talk about, there's not enough time to present every single line of this book. Um, so we're going to try to present the overall. Um, but I'm hoping that we're going to have an engaging uh, experience that we're going to, um, feed off of each other and that we're going to have a, you know, something at the end of this that we can walk away with. Um, hopefully Emery and I can bring that for you. Uh, that's my hope. You know, I've had many things change today that uh, I didn't expect. Um, but, uh, I was born and raised in Maplewood, New Jersey. Uh, it's a nice town. Uh, when I was growing up, I couldn't wait to get out of there. As an adult, I was like, wow, that was a pretty good town I grew up in. Uh, it was kind of like Mayberry, you know. I mean, it was it was uh, probably middle class, upper middle class, um, not a lot of crime. Um, but um, it, was, it was a period where um, drinking, uh, the drinking age was always ahead of me, so I was always behind it. However, I'd never had a problem getting uh, alcohol. I remember my first drink was uh, at three years old. Um, great Irish Catholic family. My parents had a lot of power parties, celebrations. My parents would have a, a Kentucky Derby party. They would have an election party. They would have a party just to have a party. You know, and it was back in the day when men would wear ties and suits and women would get dressed up and, um, you know, they, everybody everybody was smoking and they had these nice... Rock, you know, the rock glasses, the, the, the real crystal glasses. So as a kid, I was kind of fascinated just by the whole being an adult. That's to me, that was what being an adult was. I had no idea of career, job, family, all that kind of stuff. I just knew parties. So, um, I remember I was, parents are having a party and I'm like three years old and I'm upstairs. I know I was young because I had feety pajamas on, you know. <laughs> I remember sliding across the kitchen floor. Um, I wish I still had them, but, um, uh, so I'm upstairs, and I'm at the top of the stairs kind of listening, and I'm hearing the laughter, and I'm hearing, you know, the classes clink, and I'm hearing all of the stuff going on around this thing. So I went downstairs and snuck into the kitchen, and my dad was at the time pouring this really cool liquid that was green, and uh, it was called cream de menthe, and he's pouring it into these fancy glasses. And each one was different, you know. The cordial glasses, they're all different and all different sizes. And I said, I want some, like any Irish kid. And uh, he said, uh, he said, okay. 
gave me my own glass and said, go into the bathroom, don't let your mother see you. And uh, I did. And so I went in the bathroom. I remember down in it. I, w- I wanted to drink it quick because my mom couldn't see me. And I felt this warmth, and I was like, wow. I got up on the toilet seat and looked in the mirror, and I smiled. And all my teeth are green, but my face was like red, and I'm smiling. And I just, I kind of remember the feeling, you know, that calm, cool, that that just feeling like everything's going to be okay. And and so I, I jumped down and, and went upstairs and went to bed. No consequences. No, next morning, they, they didn't find my tricycle up on the front lawn. They didn't, they didn't have the cops knocking on the front door. There was no strange woman in my bed. You know, there was no major consequences. But I do remember the feeling. And the feeling, you know, was of warmth. I just, I remember that feeling one other time. And that's if I think back on my life and my dad, um, used to have this ritual when I was, he would give me a bath and then I'd go downstairs and I'd sit on his knee and he'd take a towel and he'd throw it over my head and he would just kind of dry my hair. You know, I remember that because I felt safe. I was protected. I was loved. Everything was okay. Even though I couldn't see anything in front of me, I had no vision beyond that moment. I felt safe and protected. So needless to say, I didn't start drinking every single day. Okay? Jumping ahead a little bit, I think we socially started drinking when I was around 10. My neighborhood was a little progressive, you know, and we always play cards, and uh, and we'd be cool adults, so we'd mix iced tea with beer. And at that time, it was Schmitz. Yeah, it wasn't pretty. I mean, I don't know about you, but... Drinking for me was never a pleasurable thing. It wasn't like, oh, great, let's have some Schmitz and tea. It's really good. It was, let's drink because we can steal it and it, it's cool, right? So we were drinking Schmitz and iced tea, and that's kind of how we started. Um, it was a sneaking thing. It was a thing to kind of get away with. It was a, I don't want to say peer pressure thing, but it was, um, it was a cool thing. It was cool to be out of control. It was cool to kind of limit or, or, or venture into this world that was not, um, not safe and protected. It was kind of interesting to go wander around in that world drunk. Um, so, you know, our, our adventures would be on a weekend, um, at a party when somebody's parents went away. They were little journeys, little, they were little trips that we would occasionally go on. And I was going on them with a lot of my friends. The problem was when we were going on these journeys, they were just little trips to my friends. To me, they were a lot more. And so what happened was after a period of time was they were moving on after the trip and I was continually thinking about the trip. My mind would continue the story. It would continue in that world. It would want to be there for longer than I was there. All right? So now my mind is now is participating in this drinking game. I couldn't wait during school, you know, high school years. I couldn't wait till the next time I was going to be able to do that thing, you know? The first time the cops found me was when I was 14, I remember when my parents went away and we went drinking. And uh, we were playing cards at, uh, you know, Mark, I won't give his last name. Mark, he's not in the pro, Mark, Mark's house. And his brothers were playing quarters and they were picking on me. And if you had no quarters and you know drinking and you know 14 year old, I lost big. <laughs> and they, they found me in my own vomit outside of town. And, uh, you know, the kind of like, they found me with my hair sticking up, the, like kind of when your head's in it, you know, and you're like Pee Wee Herman, your hair's sticking straight up. And they woke me up, four of them with flashlights, and they're like, get up. And so I did the best I could, and they're like, so, you know, and they want to play with you. They, you know, they're not concerned about you. In Back in that day, they didn't really concern about you. They just like to play with you. So they'd be like, so, your friends left you. I'm, no, they didn't. You know, and where do you live? Over there. And um, one guy did, one guy, I think he was a rookie, he's like, should we take him to a hospital? 
And they're like, ah, and they're like, ha, ha, ha. And so finally somebody said, can you make it home? And I said, yes. And they said, go. And so I started walking home, and then they said, run. And so I'm running. And I don't even remember the run home, but I made it home, and I threw up. I don't know how I missed the toilet because I was leaning on the toilet, but I missed the toilet. I cleaned it up with tissues, which isn't a good idea because that gets in the grout and it's all over the place. Somehow I changed, got into bed, and went to sleep. Next morning, my parent, I said, when did you get home? To my parents, and they said, we talked to you for over an hour. Yeah. To this day, I don't know what I said, but that was the beginning of the lie. That was the beginning of the cover-up. You know, I knew that there was some, I don't know if I knew there was something wrong with it, but I was the kind of drinker that just had a bad memory. I didn't call, I didn't know what it was called, the blackout. I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was a bad memory. I just, I, for some reason, I um, forget things when I drink. It's okay. So most 14 year olds would, after that experience, go home and the next day say, man, I can't do that. Like, that's really dangerous. Like, that's not, that's messed up. The cops found you, you threw up, you don't remember anything, and your parents probably caught you. That, you know, you probably shouldn't drink. I went to school on Monday, and I heard the stories about Crazy Dave. He's a wild man. He's nuts. That's so funny. He was really funny. He was walking around town, sitting on cars, and we were laughing, and we had, you know, it was, it was a great time. I couldn't wait till the next weekend. I want to go there again. Alcohol is taking me where I can't go on my own because of fear, ego, pride, whatever reason. I'm holding myself back. Alcohol is liberating me. Alcohol is allowing me to go where I can't go on my own. This stuff is great. I can talk to women. I can stand up to bullies. I can go out. I can defy authority. I can't do that when I'm not drinking because for whatever reason, I'm too scared. So if I can just get a little of this stuff, not go overboard, maybe if I can just have a few and not go overboard, maybe it's tolerance. Maybe I just have to get tolerance built up so that I can handle it and not black out. Maybe that's what I need to do. But from that moment on, the journey was for Dave to find the right formula between alcohol and him to be able to live life the way he wanted to, like everyone else. Because that's really what it looked like to me. I had a friend, Paul, that I probably started drinking around the same time. We were about the same age, a month apart. And, um, you know, he was, seemed to be able to do that. He be able, he seemed to be able to go out occasionally and have a few beers and not really have major consequences that I saw. So I'm doing something wrong, but I, I think I can figure it out. And that's what it was. You see, I, I believe that's what the journey is for every alcoholic. You hear this, I, I don't prescribe to slips and that kind of stuff the word re relapse and, you know, things, there's an assumption that we make. There's an assumption that when somebody walks into AA that somehow they got a power now, a power that they never had before, and they have this new knowledge. Just because they walk through the doors of AA, they, now they have a new knowledge, and they should probably never, ever drink again. If they ever, ever drink again, it's their choice, and for that reason, it's called a relapse. I don't agree with that. I did the same thing when I was 14. Just because I didn't walk through the doors of AA doesn't mean that it's called, not called a relapse. Because what is somebody doing? Somebody really is what they're doing is they're coming in. They admit they have a problem, but for whatever reason, the peculiar mental twist, they, they, they pick up a fir the first drink again, and they drink. We will continue that pattern until we get to a position where we have a spiritual awakening. Because when it comes to alcohol, we're insane. I'm going to get into all that, though. I digress. I got off. All right, so 14, here I am lying in my own vomit, and, the, you know, the cops come, and they play with me. So any normal, any normal drinker would just say, wow, I can't do that again. I said I can't wait. You know, so it was looking forward to weekend journeys. Somebody's parents went away. 
somebody's, uh, you know, um, somebody's parents, maybe we were having a kegger or maybe we were going, we used to have a club called Club Friday. We'd go into the woods and get a keg every Friday. Uh, and after school, we'd start drinking and then wander into town drunk, you know, <laughs> like that was fun. Um, so we were doing a lot. And granted, most of us were athletes. Most of us were, we actually were down on cigarettes because we were athletes and we were healthy. But we have Club Friday where we're drinking every Friday. You know, like it just didn't make any sense. Um, but, you know, this was our, this is the club that we had. So Club Friday, every Friday we would drink. So I'm looking forward to these weekends. I'm starting to see also, when I'm looking back, I didn't see it when I was in it, the groups that I'm hanging out with were changing. I'm starting to become what I, you call a chameleon. Because the guys that I was hanging out weren't partying every weekend. So I needed to find a much more um, frequent supply. So I was pretty much friends with everybody. And, you know, I was king of the nerds if I had to be, and I was hanging out with the waste, the junkies or the stage crew. I don't know if these groups mean anything to you guys. Um, but I was hanging out with the leathers or the leathers, yeah. Uh, I hang out with the leather. I'm a leather. If, if, you, if you're having a party, I'm a leather, you know. So... I'm trying to fit in just so that I can keep experiencing these things and I can keep, for whatever reason, I never drank um, my family's alcohol. I don't know why. Even at a young age, um, my dad taught me how to make martinis. Um, it was our thing. It was like, you know, some dads teach their kids how to make a, a go-kart. <laughs> my dad taught me how to make a martini. So I would meet him after work every day. I would wait for him to come up the street, and I would have a martini in his hand by the time he walked in the door. And I had my own um, jigger. It was my jigger, and it was, it was in a special spot, and that's what I used to, to measure everything. <clears throat> and since I knew he would give me the olives, I would put like ten olives in it and suck on those olives, you know. So even then you could tell. Um, but by the time I was 14, my dad uh, entered AA. Now, at 14, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what is your problem? Like, I'm drinking more than you are. How could you lose your job, your family, your life? How could you let this get to this point? When, he came, when they came to me and told me he had a problem, I'm like, Deal with it. Like, get over it. Just stop drinking. It doesn't make any sense to me. I can handle it, but if you can't handle it, just stop drinking. I'm thinking, what a loser. I'm really, I'm like, what a loser. So, you know, needless to say, when I have to go visit him at rehab, they pick me up. We go visit dad after school. We go to family group. I don't remember anything that they had to say about family group. Um, all I heard was, if your father's alcoholic, if you have 50% chance you're going to be alcoholic. And that stuck in my brain for whatever reason. But everything else I didn't hear. And then we go up to visit Dad, and Dad is showing me um, what he made in art. <laughs> yeah, That's a you know, clay figure he made. Great, Dad. You know, finger paintings he made. Great. <laughs> These are my friends. I don't want to meet your friends. They're losers. Everybody's a loser here. I just want to get the hell out of here um, and not deal with it. And that was fine with my family because we didn't talk about it. You know, I just had to deal with that short little thing, and then we're never going to. He hid his books in the sock drawer, you know. Um, he really, all I knew was he went to somewhere on Wednesday nights. Um, he made coffee, and he came home with donuts. You know, like that's as much of AA that I got. Um, so when it came, unfortunately, and I, I share this because when it came time for me to enter AA, I was so ashamed and I thought it was something we shouldn't talk about. I didn't tell my parents for a year and a half while I was going to meetings. So there was never any communication. When I was deep in the doo-doo, I had nowhere to turn. Um, so I really, I, I just encourage people if they can, you know, to kind of, try to open up dialogue. Um, so my dad enters AA, and, and I just can't deal with it. Um, so I get to college, and I take off. I go to college, and that's it. All bets are off, man. I'm just, 
I'm not yet by the time I'm a senior, I'm not even going to classes from first test to final exam. Uh, I mean, seriously, I don't know how I, I was second in class. I was second in my class from the bottom. Okay. There was one guy <laughs> there. The guy's got to be in AA because there's one guy that was worse than I was at class. I mean, that is pathetic. Um, I didn't care. My goal every day, I would walk to, I would get a ride to school or I'd walk to school. I lived on campus for three years and I would get my book bag and I would go down to the quad and I would hang out there and never make a class. Because I just, I thought, well, if I meet, if I become somebody's friend today, that's a, that's a win. Like, I, I was doing hug a day, keeps the doctor away. That's, I wa- I just wander, I was a cartoon character. And I'm thinking I'm big man on campus, and I am just a big cartoon character. Like, there's Dave. What a mess. I thought they wanted to hang out with me because I was so great, but it was because I was just so pathetic, you know? Like, none of them would hire me for a job, but they would watch me, you know, hang out with me, make fun of me. I was the guy that at the bar would bump into the record player continuously. You know that guy? You hear the scratch and everybody goes, ugh, and I'm like, oh, sorry, you know, and then I do it again. Um, I, I, I worked at bars. I just, I continually perpetuated that. So, um, at some point, I, I'm, I have in the back of my head 50%, 50%, 50%. So I'm asking, people as I'm going growing up I was working with a guy and he was an alcoholic and I said you know I have 50 percent chance that I'm an alcoholic and he said I can tell by the way you're drinking you're not thank you all right I'll have another all right I was looking for validation I, I went away after college and did a year of volunteer work with uh with at a school for Native Americans in, in Mexico in New Mexico and that's how I ended up. I ended up in a in a, a pueblo of Mexico. It was called uh, Juarez, Juarez, Mexico. And I'm sitting across the table from a nun, and we're pouring shots of tequila. And the priest was tired, so he went to bed. And I said to her, I said, you know, I have 50% chance that I'm an alcoholic. And it's like 2 in the morning, and I'm drinking shots with a nun. And she says... Um, well, why, you know, why? And I tell her, and she says, well, ask the priest. His father's an alcoholic. So I knock on his door, and I'm like, Father Paul, you know, I, there's a chance. That it's, he's like, it's 2 in the morning. You're knocking on my door to ask me if you're an alcoholic? I said, well, I'm kind of concerned. What do you do? He goes, I just watch myself and make sure I just don't drink too much. Bam. I'm off again. Like, each time I'm asking people, like, Call me an alcoholic. Go ahead. And none of them would do it. So I said, fine, I, I don't have a problem. It's not until I get um, way later, uh, I'm working at a, a career. I, I continually did well in careers, but then I would come to a point, if you know what I'm talking about, you get to a point where everything's about to fall, and so you quit and you move to the next career. I did that a lot. I'm out at a new career. Everything's going great. Um, I'm starting to drink more and more and more and more. Uh, I'm drinking to the point where now I'm drinking at work uh, because I'm working and the rationalization's coming in. I'm working so hard that everybody else gets to go a happy hour. Why shouldn't I have a few beers at work? Because I deserve it. Yeah, you guys get to go out because you have lives. I am working so hard at the career of helping others that I deserve to drink a few beers at work. Well, it turned out to be, you know, one time I woke up and there's fire engines around the building. And I come out at 2 in the morning drunk and disheveled because I'd been sleeping on my office couch wondering what's going on and uh, freaking out because I'm like, I'm burning the building down. And it turned out there was a brush fire, brush fire behind the building. But they're kind of like, who's this guy? I hear the engines and lights are on the building and here I come. Hey, what's up? Um, so I realized I got to do something about my drinking. But the reason I drink is because I'm so stressed. And the reason I'm so stressed is because I was the son of an alcoholic. So let me explore that with a therapist. 
So I did the ACOA issue, and I went to the therapist, and after a few times showing up there drunk, she suggested I try AA. Smart therapist. I thought, hey, everybody gets to drink after work, so why shouldn't I have a few beers before going to my therapist to talk about my alcoholic father? Makes perfect sense. So she gave me a 12 and 12, and, and I went to my first meeting. And now this is where I have a friend, Paul, that I talked about earlier. Paul drove an hour down to take me to an, my first AA meeting, and he had no idea what AA was. He wasn't an alcoholic, but he knew I needed help. And he said, what do you need me to do? And I was terrified. So I said, come now. You know, i got to go to this meeting. We show up at the outside of the building. All the lights are out. Um, I said, there's no meeting. Let's go. And he's like, no, let's check it out. So we go in. There's two guys sitting there. I'm like, there's no meeting. Let's go. And he goes, no, let's talk to them. Talk to them. They did the old, yeah, if there's a coffee pot and a guy, then there's a meeting. And I'm like, uh. And I just wanted to hide. I just wanted to sit in the back. But I walked through those doors because I knew there was something wrong and I needed help and, there's, and there possibly was an answer there. Was I ready? I don't know. Probably not, because it took me, you know, about five more years. But this plan, the seed was planted, you know. I mean, at least I was introduced. At least I'm exploring that there's something wrong. At least I know that I can go to a place and get some help. I walked away from that. I didn't go to another meeting for months. For months. I was just, I didn't want to go back for that embarrassment. But eventually I went back with a friend of mine at work. Um, I heard he wasn't drinking, so I asked him. Um, and he started taking me to meetings down in Trenton. There was a, a 24 club, Allen club down there. And we're going to some hardcore meetings. And uh, we're showing up late. We're leaving early. and But, you know, I'm going. And uh, finally I asked him, I said, how's this not drinking thing going for you? And he said, well, it's, I'm having no problem with it. It's the pot that's getting to me. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I can't go with him now, you know. So I'm, I'm going to meetings. I've got a commitment on a men's meeting on a Wednesday night, and I'm going every Wednesday, and I'm making that coffee. I, the first time I made it, I was terrified. I got doilies for the cookies. That's how scared I was. I'm like, this better be perfect. It took me a half hour to pick the right cookies. You have to have the right... It has to be economical and good, right? Because God forbid the treasurer gets mad at me because I'm spending too much money or the guys get mad at me because the cookie sucks. So I got to get the right cookie. And I found archways. Archways are the best compared, you know, the overall value for cookie. So I'd show up with the doilies and I'm making it. The first time I made coffee, the coffee pot didn't work. Oh, the guys show up and they're pouring mud. And I'm like, Oh, I've never made coffee in my life. And so now it takes three alcoholic engineers to sit around and talk about what's wrong with it. Um, but, uh, you know, I felt horrible. But I made it every single week because I had a commitment. But I was drinking every single night. I knew, I knew I wanted to stop. I, I, I really did. I knew I didn't want to live this life. I just didn't think I could make it through the night. I just didn't think I could... I thought my mind's going to explode if I can't stop this thinking. My nerves are going to fall apart if I can't... if I just can't get that relief. I know you want me to stop. I know I have to because I want to live a normal life. But just not right now. Okay? Just not right now. I'll keep going to the maze. I'll keep going to make the coffee. But let, you know, I'm not ready for the rest of my life thing yet. All right? So the last meeting I went to, they, I show up and the guy's like, you know what? We need a speaker. You've been coming around for a while. Can you speak? I'm like, sure. He goes, you got a lot of time? I'm like, not really. I'm like DT. I'm going through DTs. <laughs> Because I had stopped drinking like a day before. And I'm like, not really. Um, so I tell you, I was, I was good. I shared. I made him cry, I think. I mean, it was great. <laughs> was I honest? Not one bit. I, I didn't tell him I was drinking. But, uh, and, and I remember the horrible thing was at the ending, I had to do the Lord's Prayer. I couldn't remember the prayer. 
I'm st- we're standing there for like five minutes before somebody had to start it. They're looking at me like, okay. I'm like, I have no idea. God's in it. God somewhere. And so, so I stopped going to that meeting. Um, but I, there was something that always brought me back to meetings. What eventually happened is, um, I, uh, I had to do the geographical cure of moving home with parents for the second time after college. And uh, I told all the neighbors, you know, I'm moving home because I'm saving to buy a house. I didn't have a dime to my name. There was no house plans. I just had nowhere else to go. And my parents took me in again. You know, they, I told, they thought I was trying to get clean. So they took me in. Um, and they gave me some leeway, but I was drinking every single night, you know. I mean, it got to the point where, um, in the end for me, I was drinking a quart of vodka a night. And, you know, it's tough to get a quart into your parents' house in your pants, you know, walking straight and not having it fall out and break on the front steps. Um, so I would every night kind of sneak in, you know, go in with, hey, mom. Going to bed, see you later, and sneak upstairs, get it, put it under my, my mattress, and uh, wait till they went to sleep. And then when they went to sleep, then I could start drinking. And this is the alcoholic that I was. All I did was I chugged until I passed out. I drank as quickly as I could so I could pass out and get it over with. Because it really was utilitarian at that point. It was not the days of pleasure. It was not the days of just trying to escape a little bit. It was, I need to fall asleep as quickly as possible so I stop thinking, and then I'll wake up and go to work. I only bought a quart because I didn't want to die. I thought if I bought a gallon, I would drink it all and die. So I had, I was actually limiting myself by how much I, I drank because I knew I was going to drink it all. But I wanted enough so that when I passed out, I would wake up probably about two or three, and I had enough to knock me out again. Because my worst fear, my worst fear was not my parents would catch me, that I would lose my job, that my friends would disown me, that I might never, ever have a family, that, um, you know, that I'd be kicked out of my parents' house. My worst fear was, oh, my God, what if I wake up at 3 o'clock and I don't have any more booze? then I might have to actually sit here and watch the sunrise. <laughs> that sucked. You know, with half a buzz and the sun's rising and birds are chirping and they're all happy. You know that? God knocked me out. So I had just enough to make it through the morning. And I had enough to give a little nip to go to work. And what I wanted, my plan was what I wanted because I knew me. I wanted and I had hope. This is how I had hope. I wanted there to be no booze left in the house by the time I went to work because that was going to be the day, that was going to be the day I finally got the willpower to stop because everybody's telling me to stop. Everybody's telling me, why don't you just grow up? Everybody's telling me, why don't you just stop drinking? I knew that there must be some willpower. Maybe it's a lack of really wanting to live. Maybe I don't have anything to live for. Maybe I don't have willpower because my life sucks. If I get a better life, then I'll, be, I'll stop drinking. If I get more money, I'll stop drinking. If I get the perfect girlfriend, I'll stop drinking. If I get the perfect family, I'll stop drinking. There must be something, something missing from my life. So let me look at Paul's life. Maybe Paul has something in his life that I can, I can pull from. Because he doesn't drink alcoholically. So maybe there's something about his life that makes him willingly not over drink. So let me leave the house with no booze left. Because then when I come back, and this is going to be the day when I get back to that house, and I finally decide I'm not going to drink again, I don't want any there to tempt me. So what usually happened? Well, it usually happened is I get to work, I'm still drunk, so I'm okay. Somewhere around 12 o'clock I might eat, and then about 3 o'clock I start detoxing. So around 4 or 5 o'clock I can't wait to get to that liquor store because I just need to do this one more time. One more time. Then I'll start the rest of my life. Or... I can't stop today because it's Friday. Who stops on the weekend? Or it's Monday, so now I have to drink all week because I can't stop during the week. You know, there was always a reason. I just kept coming back and taking that first drink. 
I was willing. I had hope. I had desire. I had willingness of some kind, but it was just misdirected. I walked through those doors in 1993 because I didn't want to live this life anymore. I wanted to live a better life for me and my family. But I had no idea what that commitment was. All I knew was that there was something wrong. It's not anybody's fault. It's just for whatever reason, I had some more lessons to learn. I had some more experiences to experience. I had more to go through before an awakening was possible. Luckily for me, the rooms allowed me to experience that. The rooms that I went to allowed me enough freedom to do what I was going to do. And I truly am blessed for that. Because for me, what happened was that I found something to pull me back. And that was people that actually listened to me and, and I became friends with and understood. Like, you remember that story with the nun? We don't give enough credit to just the identification. People are here because they don't know anybody else in their lives that can talk to them like we talk to them. They're here because we understand the mental twist. We understand the psychology behind it. We understand the twisted idea that we want, you know, that we're going to drink no matter what. And I needed to find that first. I needed to find that. That identification is huge. That's half the battle. Is it the whole thing? No, but it's half the battle. So I showed up at, at the rooms continually because I didn't want to lose that. I was afraid I was going to lose those people if I didn't come back. And I found them finally. I found a place to fit in, so let me keep going. The first place I ended well, so I ended up going home um, and, get, and started, and I was drinking still, <laughs> needless to say. Um, I'm commuting to work. It's an hour away. So one day I decided, you know, I had like 30 days. Oh, and meanwhile, my mom got me into outpatient program that my dad graduated from. So I tried. I went there to, they went there to send me to talk to the, 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 the counselor about me, about being an ACOA. And I came back. My mom's like, how did it go? And I said, well, he gave me this test and I passed. And I start Tuesday. <laughs> She's like, I didn't expect that. She had no idea that I was an alcoholic. She thought I was going for my father. She always did say, you're going to be just like your father. And uh, here I am. And so mom, mom's got the black belt in family group, and, he, and, her, and her husband and her son are going to outpatient program. I'm going to outpatient. I'm drinking. I'm leaving outpatient, driving around the corner, stopping at the liquor store, getting a bottle and going home. So obviously, I want something, but I don't know what it is, and I'm not ready to stop the, the, I'm not, I'm not ready to give up my only solution. I found it. I can't, I don't think it's possible to live without this. So until you give me a guarantee, I'm not gonna let go of it. And I haven't heard any guarantees yet. I've heard a lot of talk, but I haven't heard any guarantees. So I'm going to meetings because of this outpatient, and it's a clubhouse kind of atmosphere. Great, great for me. Great for me to just, any time I went there, there was a meeting, somebody cleaning up, somebody setting up, somebody just sitting there. So any time I went there, I had help, or just at least companionship. We had three softball leagues out of, or teams out of that house, which sounds like a lot, but the, the honest thing is that we couldn't get along, so we had to have three teams. There was so many resentments. I mean, it was a dysfunctional family, but we were we we were there. Um, but there was th there was activities to do. Yeah, every Friday night was 8:30 meeting, and then the diner. You know, we'd have 10, 15, 20 people every weekend. Um, and uh, and and Anne Marie and I we we grew up in the same house, and uh, it was wonderful. Um, uh, I wouldn't give I wouldn't take any of that back. Um, but something happened to me about two and a half. So let me ask you, let me tell you how I finally ended. So I'm, uh, I'm driving, uh, I'm, I'm working an hour away. Um, I'm going to meetings. 
and uh, my sponsor, I have a sponsor, and I meet him at a men's meeting on a Monday night. It's a men's meeting, you know, serious men's meeting. And I'd already in my mind said, I just need to do this one more time. So I went to the men's meeting and I shared. Now I could have shared, I'm going to drink. I want a drink. I have a bottle in my car. Stop me so I don't drink. What does Dave share? Everything's great. I'm doing great. You guys are all great. And we walk out, and I shook everybody's hand. My sponsor is 10 feet away from the car. All I had to say to him was, I need help. Help me. I have a bottle in the car. Get me away from this bottle. All I said to him was, I'll see you in a couple of days. I already had made the decision. I already had relief in my mind. I already felt the results of drinking. Got in the car, started drinking on my way out. Again, I just need to do this one more time. I have three days. I'll drink my face off tonight. I will detox tomorrow. By Wednesday meeting, I will be okay. That's the rationale we have, right? By Friday, I'm driving in a blackout. <laughs> Shot right over Wednesday. Didn't know about the physical allergy. Totally took over. So I'm driving in a blackout. Three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm driving home. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm driving home in a blackout. Um, it's like I started at like 7 o'clock. Somehow uh, got a flat tire, um, passed out in a schoolyard, uh, called for help. I actually thought I was in Elizabeth. I was in Clark. Or I thought I was in Clark. I was in Elizabeth, wrong town. So needless to say, somehow I get home. And I get home, wake up the next morning, and I can't remember where my car is. And it's not like I can't remember where my car is uh, what parking spot? It was what town did I park it in? It literally took us driving around for two days to find my car with a map. When you got to use a map to find your car, <laughs> a map of New Jersey, not even a map of the county of New Jersey, you got that's drinking. All right. So I uh, I get I get I, we find my car. Now the reason I'm sharing this is because. This is the insanity of it. And if you think that you're, you know, it's not possible, just think back to this insanity in your own life. And, and we can relate this to any situation in my life. I have the capability of twisting it this much. I drank to the point where I lost my car and I couldn't remember what town it was in. Got it? Forty days later, I said, Maybe just one tonight. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. Of course I said at the moment, I don't want to drink anymore. I'm done. I'm da, da, da. But something happens over 30 days, 40 days that, that just rearranged that story for me and made it palatable for me to pick up one more time. And I did at the same job. I drove the same route five days later in a blackout with the same car. I ended up at my parents' house uh, completely unable to walk across the living room. I, I shot for the couch that was there, and I ended up over there. They accused me of being drunk. Obviously, I denied it. <laughs> what are you talking about? And at that point, they were like, you're done. We're done. We're done. So I called my buddies from AA, and I'm like, I completely messed up, man. Like, I'm, and I crocodile tears, you know. You never loved me. I blamed my dad for not making amends to me. I pulled out every, I, I had fully cocked. I pulled out everything. You love my sister more. That's why I drink. So I tried everything, and nothing worked. Two guys come over from AA. One guy sitting right in front of me, Pat. Um, love and death. And he go, he's, he's looking at me, and he honestly, he's like, look, the way I see it, you have two choices. This is North Jersey. The way I see it, you have two choices. You can stay here and listen to her, or you can go to rehab. I'm like, rehab. Now, they did one important thing. He said, you call. That was huge for me. 
because he was not going to clean up my mess. He said, you need rehab, then call. Go ahead. I had to call around all the hospitals and see who would take me. They drove me to the emergency room. I got to the emergency room 11 hours after my last drink. Um, at that time, my blood alcohol level was still 0.275. So I was probably driving around a 0.4. They sat down and asked me a lot of questions. I had to wait for 11 hours for my blood alcohol to go low enough to be admitted to the flight deck. <laughs> like to qualify for the flight deck, I have to calm down a little. So um, <laughs> why did I not leave? I don't know. Why didn't I not just say I, had, I sat there for 11 hours and just waited? And, uh, you know, one of the funny things is that they, and this is bad for me, I'll tell you, after complete tears, to humiliation, driving to the hospital, sitting in the emergency room, within, I'd say, a half hour, my ego was already trying to pick up the nurse. The ego already saying, you've got this, man. This is nothing. You're, the hard part's over. Now you're on. Two weeks, I'll be out of rehab. I'll come back. I'll swing by. You know, <laughs> and then they have interns come, the residents who've never seen an alcoholic come talk to me. So they're like, "Well, we've never seen an alcoholic." They, oh, really? And I, now I'm an expert on alcoholism. I've got my big book. I'm still wasted, and I'm talking to him about alcoholism. You know, and this is just how the insanity goes on. You know, because our ego is so eager to grow again and it's so eager to come back um, that, you know, it, it's just it's amazing how much of our mind is involved. That's why, uh, you know, again, I can't judge. I have to have complete tolerance of others when I'm walking around the rooms and I'm walking around in life even. Because I, how can I look at somebody and say, I can't believe they believe that? When... There's some really crazy ass stuff that I believed or believe. I don't even know if the truth is the truth now. You know? The best that we can hope is that we got a group of people. Um, you know, and I remember the old home groups. You know, we had a home group that you'd see the same people. I'll tell you, there was an old timer, Johnny Mack, that did more for me than any other AA member in the beginning. And the re only thing that he really did he talked about the four absolutes, but the biggest thing he did was every single time I saw him, he hugged me and told me he loved me. That's it. He didn't thump. He didn't talk about these steps. He just said, keep coming back and I love you. If anybody can tell you I love you, I love you. And I had never had that. I looked for him every single time I went back to that meeting. And he did more for that meeting than most of us did just by that. By being true to himself, being honest, being open and loving. Okay? So, I ended up at this, uh, this kind of home group. And, um, I was doing everything. I was doing, um, I was doing, uh, speaker, treasurer, you know, sober softball, cookie commitment. Um, you know, anything they asked me to do, I was doing. And uh, I would be there five days a week, uh, seven days a week, maybe ten meetings a week. And I was just entrenched in this, partially because I just really enjoyed it and partially to get out of my parents' house. But it took me five years of bouncing in and out of AA to even get 30 days. I knew the mentality of, I knew my mind and, and the feeling of relapsing. I used to hate when I'd go to a meeting and I'd be like, you go to the beginner's meetings? I don't know. Back in the day, they would say, okay, we're going around the room. Who's got more, less than 30 days? Oh, God. And I'd have to raise my hand again. You know, I just felt like such a loser and I didn't want to do it. Sometimes I would not do it just because I didn't want to share again how I'm coming back one more time and I'm going to tell you how it's going. I don't want to. I don't, I don't really want to. All I want is for this to stop. And I just, I got tired of going back and going back and going back. 
And it would just always come down to just one more time. My mind would just convince me to have one more. And then I'd have that one and I'd be off to the races. So I finally was able to put some time together. And I think it was completely by my first sponsor was just a service junkie. And we did a lot of service. I did a lot of speaking commitments. I did a lot of things. Um, I had a really tight network. We did a lot of things together. You know, we'd go to restaurants and people think we were wasted. We were having so much fun. You know, like 10 people. And I remember thinking, I'll never laugh again getting sober. You feel, I, there's no way I'm getting sober. I'll never have fun in my life again. And I remember sitting in a restaurant crying because I was laughing so hard. You know, you get that, all of a sudden you're laughing and then crying. Like, that was cool to me. Um, but something happened at two and a half years. Um, I'm living with a couple other sober people. We have our own little sober house. Uh, Amory and, and, uh, and this other guy, Steve. Um, and, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're really committed to staying sober. Um, but I remember being in a meeting and looking around and my network is gone. Like my sponsor just moved to Texas. My best friend got married. Um, some of the guys that I was, I was staying sober with went out. I looked around and I'm like, I felt like a beginner again in my house, you know, my home group. I felt like a beginner and I remember driving home and starting to cry because inside I was a wreck. I was back to day one. And that's when I got home and, uh, and I was talking to Amory and Amory had started this big book thing. Yeah. The funny story is that her sponsor called her when she starts first started working together. I had like, you know, we all had like two, three years. And her sponsor calls and is like, she's running around the house going, where's a big book? She's asking me about this big book. Do we have a big book? We didn't have one in the house. Three sober people, no big book. So Anne-Marie's doing this thing and I see the change in her. So I go to, where am I going to go, of course? Not because she came to me and told me I had to do, not because I got lectured, not because, I went to the person I saw change the most. All she did was showed up, did it, and I watched her, and I watched the change, I watched it in her eyes, and I said, I want that. I want what she's got. And I'd been to a workshop, and there was a guy at the front that I said, I want that, I want what he's got. And so when she said, you got to try to contact him, I called him and he said, come on over. And we started doing the work. I had seen him six months ago at a workshop. Why didn't I call him then? I had the big book sitting somewhere. We couldn't find it, but I had it. Why didn't I call him then? Why did I, why did I wait six months? Why did I wait until one more bottom. I don't know. The spirit wasn't awakened yet. So when I called him and he said, come on over tomorrow, I went. And I traveled 45 minutes to this guy every week. And we went through the work. I, I was okay on my timeline. I don't know why I lasted two and a half years without doing any steps. I'm not saying don't do steps. I hope nobody misinterprets that. I'm just saying, you know, we have to have really just be open-minded, you know, this weekend and talk, let's talk about this stuff and, 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 and it's okay. We're, let's not, my fears were dividing the rooms. These rooms need to stay whole. Okay. I'm working, I'm, I'm sitting next to guys that are young and new. And they're talking about which meetings are good and bad. And they're judging people that talk from the podium. And they're, and they're just, they're, it's all confused. I want somebody to be able to walk through those doors like I did my first meeting and find the same thing. Love and compassion and a hug and a smile and a Johnny Mac. And the book, if so needed. I want them to come back when they're ready. I don't want to take credit for that. I want them to find their own path. 
and their path is to find a higher power. How they find that higher power is really a spiritual lifestyle. And we have one that's free that you're, you're recommended to use, but if you find another path, God bless you. Share it with me. You know, maybe there's something I can use. Okay. So, let me get back on path. Man, you guys just let me go off on a tangent. Who's in charge here? Thanks. He's a little ADD tonight. All right. I just want to hit on the, this first step. I've been kind of sharing it in my own story. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about it tonight. I have like ten minutes, I think. <laughs> hey, Bill Lee. He's not taping it. Um, so I shared my own experience, you know, and hopefully you can identify with some of that experience. When I'm working with guys, I think one of the mis, one of the least misunderstood steps is the first step. I had, oh, 15 minutes, okay. Um, I had, I had a desire, but I had no clue. Let's just say that in the short. I walked into the rooms, but I didn't know what I was walking into. They said, are you an alcoholic? I said, sure. If you're going to let me have coffee and stay here, sure. You want me to call myself a, a, a dope? Sure. <laughs> All dopes, raise your hand. I am here. Let me stay. Thanks. I'll be anything you want if you let me stay here. I've been with a hundred different groups just to get booze. It's not going to be anything for me to fit in with you losers just to get some coffee and some cookies. Okay? So, I'll call myself anything, but I don't know what that means. I'm not feeling it here. I'm not understanding. I think at that moment when I first entered the rooms, I had a hard time. Um, for whatever reason, I overdid it because of some lack of control because of some, excuse me, something else in my life. So I was exploring that. Um, I didn't understand the mental obsession. I didn't understand the physical allergy, okay? So when people are saying that they're alcoholic, we just assume that, oh, they got the first step. No, I was so far from getting the first step when I first said I was an alcoholic. I used to never um, uh, go through and qualify guys, but now I do. And I'm not afraid to say, well, maybe you're not. I'm not afraid to, you know, say that maybe they're not. I don't know. But I am going to go through the work. They, everybody will go through the work the same way. I'm, we're going to talk about whether you're alcoholic or not. Just because you showed up in AA and asked me to sponsor you, I'm not saying you're alcoholic. Okay? And that's just my experience. And I've run into guys. I've had guys that have said to me that they're not alcoholic after a while. Okay? Um, it's not for me to judge. But until I had that foundation then there really was no reason for me to really seek another solution. I didn't realize how bad it was, all right? But when I'm going through the guys, I think the doctor's opinion is just beautiful. That guy was brilliant. I mean, for him in his day to come up with this with really very rudimentary uh, tools is unbelievable. And there's two, two paragraphs that I read to them, okay? Um, one of them, I won't go through what page is because it's one of the XX, and it really starts getting confusing. Uh, it's, I have a third edition. This is my father's actual big book. Um, it's XXVI. Okay. And you got to do the math in the fourth and the whatever. We believe and suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon human things, their problems pile up and then and become astonishingly difficult to solve. I read that quickly because I want to go over it slowly. What does that mean to me? We believe and suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol, what's that mean when Dave drinks alcohol? The action of alcohol on me. 
chronic alcoholic, I believe I'm a chronic alcoholic, is a manifestation of an allergy. So when I drink alcohol, something happens in the manifestation of an allergic reaction or an allergy. Don't get caught up in rashes and itching, okay? Allergic reaction could be just an abnormal reaction. It doesn't happen to everybody. Allergic is kind of an abnormal reaction to something, all right? So that the phenomenon of craving, so this reaction creates a phenomenon of craving, is limited to this class and never have, occurs in the average temperate drinker. Average temperate drinker, Paul. So I'll give you an example of this in real life. Dave and Paul go to a bar. We both order a beer. Dave drinks half a beer. Paul drinks half a beer. Paul says, wow, I'm getting tired. I think I'm going to go home. What? Like, our reaction is what? You're going to what? It doesn't make any sense. Paul's an average temperate drinker. He has a normal reaction. Dave has half a beer, and Dave thinks, where am I going to go after this? Where am I going to get some more? Do I have enough money? Do I have a place to go after this bar? Can I stay out all night? Do I have to go to work? Do I have to ever go to work again? Get it? Difference between an alcoholic and, an ab and a normal drinker. We have this physical reaction that craves more. That's why each time I said, just one more tonight, three days later I end up in the blackout. Because once that craving kicks in, not only are my inhibitions gone because I'm drinking, so I'm more likely to say, F it. I try not to curse in the church. Uh, F it. But also because the physical craving is so strong, I can't fight that. It's stronger than just the mental obsession. It's the mental obsession plus. Okay? It's like cold plus. It's got that added fizz. All right? It's extra. Extra tough. So once I got the craving, I was either I was going to run into the police, hospital, family, or run out of booze. Something was going to have to dramatically happen to separate me long enough not to have that drink again. Kabish. So that's the difference between these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all once having formed the habit. So that's never, not one day at a time, that's never. I think sometimes we, t we tiptoe around it. I want my guys to be sure in their gut they are okay with living forever without having that crutch again. Because that was one of the things holding me back. I didn't think it was possible. So I held on to that. I was like, I'm, I just need this. So I want to make sure before we move forward that you're okay in the gut that I can live a life without actually having booze. Okay? And then we can go forward. So the, uh, the next one I, I want to read is at the bottom. Uh, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. When I was 10, the, uh, the sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after time differentiate the true from false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. I couldn't imagine living without it. In the end, I was living in a room with the door locked, drinking entire weekend because I thought it was my treat for working so hard, not opening the door, shades drawn, lights out, pissing in bottles because I didn't want to leave the room. And I thought it was a phase. <laughs> It's, it's just a phase I'm living in. I'll grow out of this when I, when I do better. Come on. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the ease and comfort, sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. This is huge. So what they're saying is without drinks, I am restless, irritable, and discontent. So, as alcoholics at rest, <laughs> I, am, I am a jumble of nerves. 
Does that make sense? That's why sitting on my bed, I am going nuts. And I'm thinking about the only solution that ever worked, the only thing that ever gave me ease and comfort in my life, the only thing that brought me back to that feeling like what I had when I was with my dad on his knee and he was wiping my hair with a towel. I wanted that, and that's the only thing in my life that seemed to bring me there. So I needed it, and it comes at once. It's not something you guys are promising, like, oh, you know, just keep live day, one day at a time. It'll it'll get better. I know something's going to get really good really fast right now. Okay. I can't differentiate the truth from false because I keep forgetting that it's going to lead to days and days and days of not being able to stop. So we have this restless, irritable, and discontent. So at ease, I need to find, as an alcoholic, I need to find another solution. I need to get ease and comfort in some other way besides booze. And that's what we're offering. I know it seems difficult. I know it seems kind of he magical and heebie-jeebie out there, right? Like the, the, like the Sunday morning preacher we hated when we woke up with a hangover. But it works. If you have another plan, great. God bless you. If you don't have one, we have one for free. Right here. It's already written up and it's already been tested by a few people. It's not complicated. We tend to complicate it. We have instructors, if you like, that are willing to go through it with you. Give it, give it a couple of weeks. Try it. Try all of it and then come back. If it doesn't work, you know, talk to us about it. But I guarantee it's the best thing going right now. And it's the only thing that may substitute that, that idea or that, that ease and comfort that you think you got. And in the long run, you'll enjoy your life a much, much better. I can guarantee that. So hopefully you'll stick around this weekend. I'm hoping again. I hope that we're, we're talking and we're talking about this. I have an assignment. One thing I want you to do, if you choose to, I'm not going to call everybody on it, but one of the things I want to, to, to throw out to you is if you want to, pick somebody in here you don't know. And over the next day and a half, kind of create your own idea of who they are. And then the, the, at lunch tomorrow, I want you to sit with them and talk to them and find out the real story. All right? Just a little mental exercise. Um, but uh, we're going to, I think... Thank you for letting me share. We're going to break at this point, and then we'll bring up Anne Marie. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 